Max Payne is a third-person shooter action thriller, neo-noir video game developed by Remedy Entertainment and distributed by 3D Realms, which came much to your surprise when we talked about it. Indeed. Uh, and was released back in 2001. Um, it tells the story of Max Payne, who is recovering from a rather tragic scenario where he walks into his house to find that his daughter and wife have been murdered and kind of goes off on uh, on a path to find out why this has happened and, um, you know, bring down those responsible. And the key thing to start off with here is to say that having played Max Payne again recently, um, it hasn't aged particularly well. I'll be the first no. to say it. <laughs> this, that, was a, that was an early impression of mine uh, firing up the PS2 this week. Yeah. Um, graphically... Most of the models and most of the textures are actually okay, but like Max's face itself, which constantly looks constipated, um, and some of the kind of in-house voice acting is a particularly great. And the actual controls in, of Max Payne himself are very clunky in places. If I were to describe Max Payne's face in what noise I imagine he's making when he pulls that face, it's something like... <laughs> you can imagine that face constantly making that noise. Yeah, but with that said, um, Max Payne is a pretty influential game and is still a very enjoyable game if you go back and play it now, um, mainly even just for a few things that it does and incorporates, and one of those is the bullet time mode, um, it's, if you've before, ever... Before it became hackneyed. Yeah. Uh, if you've ever watched The Matrix and you've seen the bits where everything goes into slow mode and you see the bullets flying at a tenth of the speed of what probably a hundredth of the speed of what that you would go at essentially that happens in max Payne, and you can control going into bullet time for a certain amount of time to take out a large mem a number of enemies on the screen at any one time and it's never not the coolest fucking thing you're doing a video game um certainly when you're standing behind a wall you dive to the left and you take out four guys in one go and then come back into real life as they just all fall on the floor if you've ever seen x-men days of future past and the very famous scene where quicksilver runs around the room in sort of his time and just takes everyone out and then turns back to kind of real time and everyone just drops at the same time it's essentially that uh, and it's yeah it's never not fucking awesome and that's kind of the that's kind it's of the... like it, nothing compares to the satisfaction of the first time you jump out from around the corner of a wall and catch someone directly with a headshot from a shotgun and they just spin off ragdolling into the air uh, as you land on the ground looking cool as shit. Yeah. Um, it's also... It, <sighs> there's no other way to say it. It's a grim fucking game. It's dark. Yeah. It has heavy elements of neo noir. Um, it does have a slight, slight comic effect to it a comic style to it in the way that... yeah well that's a, a lot of the narrative uh for the game is done through these kind of cutscenes uh of kind of comic book panels which i think particularly at the time because this is before um as hard as it might be for some of uh some younger listeners to understand there was a time where comic book movies and stuff weren't as ubiquitous as they are now where they weren't the cool thing in the world um, so it was kind of um, relatively unique at the time and um, a very interesting way of telling the story without having to take up massive space on the disc by having these elaborate kind of cutscenes uh, built in engine. Yeah, and it's a very effective way of doing it and it's good game design. It's one of the key things about being a game designer is how can I get the most out of a particular thing with, without using, you know, using the least amount of RAM and memory um, and the way they incorporate this by these comic book scenes is very, very very well done and there have been games that have done this since uh, to good effect one of the drawbacks I find over these scenes is that they have the one piece of music that is used for all of these scenes it does get a little bit tedious after a while um, and there is also the fact that Max uh, while the voice acting is pretty good for the most part he's just kind of gravel almost monotone approach <laughs> it, it wears on you after a while um, it does a little bit yeah. and in fact Max Payne in general the game just in its heaviness and dark undertones does wear on you after a while but if you take it in in kind of short bursts there, there's a lot to get out of it um, I guess that 
one of the things we could probably talk about is... Did you play Max Payne 3? Uh, no, I've never played Max Payne 3. Um, there are a lot of people that didn't like Max Payne 3 because it's not like Max Payne. And... Yeah. I, I was aware of that much. Yeah, and I'm kind of fine with that, to be honest. I appreciate the fact that they didn't just kind of rest on the laurels um, and they modernised the gameplay a little bit. They had to, really, because if they tried to make it anything like what it was back in 2001, I, I feel that it would have still had that clunkiness to it. It does have a little bit of the fact that it's a game that exists after Gears of War, hide behind a corridor, hide behind, uh, a, you know... Um, small wall type scenario it it, it heavily relies on that uh, gimmick but it still still has that darkness still has the the weighty tones and it's still pretty fucking bleak in places and a lot of people die but Max Payne was one of those games that I remember playing back in the day and I felt like it it had sank a little bit deeper to it. it. You know, a lot of games are just kind of superficial. Just you play them and then once you're done with them, you move on to the next one. But I, Max Payne resonated with me. You know, there's the scene where you're having, you've having you had like a drug overdose and that in itself. Yeah, you don't really do that in games very often. But you have an overdose and then you have a flashback to the night that your wife and child die and the corridor starts stretching out and all you can hear is this baby screaming in the background and then you are in a big black room and you have to walk along this thin trail of blood and have to follow it to the right exit to get out of the overdose room. And that stayed with me for a very long time. And I remember when I had to go back and do it not too long ago and I went, I'm not sure I really want to do this because I didn't particularly enjoy it, not because it's bad, but because it's just it's a very uncomfortable scene um, and there's not a lot of games that could do uncomfortable in a way that isn't completely tasteless and I don't think Max Payne does that I feel it does it in a way where it's not entirely tasteful but it's not gratuitous there's there, there's a reason behind it, it makes sense in what you're doing and it's not overly graphic it's, you know, it's more of a psychological thing it is justified and it's more of a psychological thing that it does um, yeah, what, what what are your thoughts on Max Payne? Uh, Max Payne comes out right at that uh, kind of sweet spot where um, if anything is a PS2 game and has a Rockstar stamp somewhere on the box, it's going to be pretty good. Um, it's not a game like of the kind of the uh, the PS2 or Rockstar games. It is not uh, or Rockstar related games at least. Uh, it is not one of the uh, the games I have delved deepest into, uh, and I certainly um, kind of having revisited in the last week or so can totally see where you're coming from with regards to the in terms of like how it controls and some of the visuals and stuff like that it doesn't necessarily hold up as well as some other games we've talked about on this but uh, as a guy who um enjoys his comic books enjoys his neo-noir like one of my favorite comic books of all time um is the long halloween uh, a batman story that is that plays very much like a neo-noir detective story um, I love the vibe of that comic book and this kind of is a game that evokes that kind of vibe, it's very dark it's very brooding before the kind of the dark brooding kind of comic book movie became a thing that was popular, it was still very unique at the time um, it's funny to see now like people revisiting it who haven't played it before I feel like they won't get the kind of the full grasp of how really unique it was at the time because pretty much every aspect of the game um, has been in various ways like kind of cherry picked and used in other games that have followed since. So maybe it's harder for people to kind of wrap their heads around how this wasn't really um, every game at the time wasn't like this. Um, Certainly as a kind of um, as of, what year did it come out in? About 2001. So 2001, so that's like er, that's early enough in the, the PS2's life cycle. That's about a year in, isn't it, to the PS2's life cycle, if I'm yeah, not Yeah, yeah, it was around that time, yeah. So like for an early PS2 game in particular, um, when like most people in my age group anyway are still kind of in their uh, the age where they're playing games like Spyro and things like that, it is... Uh, 
a massive change of pace to be playing something with an altogether like this is video games taken seriously this is part of the kind of an, maybe a relatively early exploration into the, the now a popular concept of kind of video games as art video games as a storytelling medium rather than just kind of jump from platform to platform and reach the end of the level kind of thing uh, it was actually telling a, a proper dark and and very grown up story um and it is very much like it's not on my kind of a desert island list of games that uh I would play relentlessly till the end of time, but it is certainly one of the ones where I acknowledge the the legacy it's had and certainly how important it was for me as a gamer to help me make that transition from playing the, like simpler games, platformers and stuff like that into much more serious and grown-up games and re- realizing the capacity uh, video games have to tell a story like that and the kind of the how in some ways how video games have an advantage over like television and movies at kind of making you feel like you're part of this incredibly dark um, and at times horrifying story of, of Max Payne's very grim life by the fact that you're kind of you have to consciously be there and interact with this rather than kind of be passively watching it uh, it is kind of it was um yeah it's a very important game at the time and um part partly probably it's partly because of that because of how influential the game is and how important the game is to a lot of people that may have uh, up, upset a lot of people when the third one deviates from the script shall we say yeah um i i feel like we should also just briefly mention the <laughs> Film. Oh, here comes the rain, by the way. <laughs> oh, yeah, aptly, aptly timed. Um, yes. Yeah, so there was a film, um, and it wasn't very good. And Starring Marky Mark. Starring our good friend Marky Mark. And I feel it was just... I was more disappointed by this than most other video game adaptation to film adaptations, uh, because it was one that I thought had the most potential. You know, because yeah. it's based. It, you would think as well, considering the timing in a post uh, Sin City world, that they could just follow that template, and it would at least have been a half decent film. Not even just that; it's the fact that the game is so heavily based off of a, a collection of films that they could just kind of extrapolate that and just twist it a little bit and, and, and do that and for about the first 15 minutes they actually do do that with the film um, and they take the, the the feel and the the just tonality of Max Payne and they actually bring it to the big screen um, but then you quickly realise that both the director and Mark Wahlberg have no interest in what Max Payne is um, and Mark Wahlberg himself made it quite clear that he never played the games he had no interest in what the games were and yeah that pretty much meant that there was no fucking chance of it being any good and um yeah it's it's a shame um yeah but it's it it's it's interesting to watch about the first 20 minutes and then realize just how quickly it drops off the side of the earth um so any i suppose because we're kind of run, run away over time here uh any sort of uh, final thoughts on uh, max Payne? It's one of those games, like you said, it's um, not necessarily one of those Desert Island discs type games, um, but I still feel it's pretty pivotal. Uh, it did come along at a time where that explosion with games was really happening and you had stuff like MGS2 was coming out around this time as well. Um, and there was that transition from that awkward early 3D phase where we was moving into the PS2 and the GameCube and developers were really finding themselves and were really finding ways to tell stories in-game itself um, and with the comic, comic books as well. Uh, the comic book uh, storyboard type setting. And it's... I feel it was actually a lot more influential than some people may give it credit for. Um, and I really like the way that they tied things up at the end of Max Payne 3. And I was really disappointed that a lot of people didn't like Max Payne 3. And I've got a good friend of mine who really didn't like Max Payne 3. Um, 
but it's it's a really good series. The first one, the second one, the Fall of Max Payne, and the third one, they were all. It's, it's a really nice package there that I hope that somewhere down the line, because fucking every trilogy series is being packaged in some form or fashion. Hopefully, we might get this at some point um, because it's something that I would definitely pick up, and it would definitely be worth picking up because there's a lot of fun to be had for them. Excellent. So that is uh, available on PS2 for those of you with a PS2 still kicking around. Uh, was it ever uh, released kind of a, uh, a port for the PS3, do you know? Uh, there, <laughs> so it's actually it's on Windows, PS2, Xbox. Uh, it's also was released for the Game Boy Advance. Amazing. And <laughs> iOS, and it's on Android. Android. Yeah. That's incredible. I'd like to see what the Game Boy Advance version of it looks like. Uh, I'm just trying to see. Uh, so we got, yeah, we got, yeah. There was no PS3 port. Like, they kind of, um, at the start, early in the PS3's uh, life cycle, there was a lot of uh, shabby ports of PS2 games being brought across. I think it, I'm pretty sure it is on the network. I'm, pre- I'm pretty sure you can download it off of the store. Um, According to Wikipedia, anyway, it doesn't seem to be. Hey, PSN. Uh, 1st of May, 2012. 2nd of oh, May, 2012. Yeah. yeah. Oh, there you go. And it's on Xbox Live. Cool. Uh, so you can check that out, or if you kind of uh, you want to experience it as it was uh, originally intended, you can pick up uh, your PS2 and have a go at that. 